I am Judy Woodward. I am the history coordinator of the Ramsey County Library System, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this event. Um, we are so delighted to have Duchess Harris, Professor Duchess Harris of McAllister with us today who will be talking on the enormously contemporary topic of race and policing. This, for those of you who have been here before, you know she is a familiar face. This is her third session with us and we hope it is the start of many, many more because you'll find out how good a speaker she is in just a minute. I need to thank our sponsor, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, who uh, gives us such help in administering these programs. Also, our funding source, Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, which came into being through the passage of the Legacy Amendment, without which we could not do what we do. So, thank you all very much. And now we're gonna wait Okay, and now I'm going to introduce Duchess Harris. Thank you very much, Judy. I appreciate it. Working with Judy is most of the fun for this. Um, the rest of the fun starts now. Um, wow, um, I guess you guys didn't have anything else better to do? Uh, this is a pretty big crowd. You know, it's not quite Super Bowl, but you know, I'm flattered. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about a book that um, I recently published back in September entitled Race and Policing. Um, I see some familiar faces in the crowd. If you've attended my Black Lives Matter talk, you'll know that this is a different talk. That's a different book. Um, so there won't be any repeats between these two talks. Um, and so I'll just start off with how this book opens up. And the book opens up with um, a recounting of the Eric Garner um, killing in New York. Um, and as we all know, Eric Garner was um, detained by the police. Um, he infamously said that he could not breathe. He still um, experienced a chokehold and made national news. Um, on the way to the hospital, he passes away. And um, then, of course, there are the questions about um, who is culpable in this. Um, one of the things that um, I want to talk about in this discussion today with this notion of race and policing is for us to broaden our thoughts about the police and think about the police being both police officers who are white and police officers of color, right? And so often when we talk about the police, I think in our imagination, we envision the police as being white. They're not always white. Um, and some of the officers at the Eric Garner event um, were in fact African American. Um, and so what we end up having, which unfortunately we've had several times in the last few years, um, is a big trial um, where the police are brought forward um, on charges. Um, Officer Pantaleo, who was in charge um, of the scene, was found not guilty. Um, and we are in a climate now that um, when police officers are brought forward and then not um, found to be guilty, then you often have um, uprisings and protests. And so that is the backdrop for this book. Um, and so after I open up with that, the next thing I do is try to answer the question, which I think is always an important question when we look at these contemporary moments, which is how did we get here, right? People always wanna know what is the backdrop of this. And so the backdrop of this is that policing has always been controversial in the United States. One of the things that I found in my research was um, how long it took for certain communities of color to even be allowed to become police officers, which is something that we don't talk about very much. So one of the things that I cover in the book is that in the African American community, for instance, um, and early on, it's just men. Um, African-American men aren't allowed to become police officers until the 1940s. 
Okay. And so that's partly why, in our imagination, police officers are just white, even though that's not true, particularly in like large metropolitan areas, right? And you don't even have to be, you know, New York large. As we know, St. Paul police officer, um, that's a very diverse um, police department. And so not only does it take until the 1940s before you start um, desegregating police, then there was the issue of which neighborhoods were they allowed to police? So they were only allowed to police black neighborhoods. And early on, they weren't allowed to carry firearms. And so this is, this is like a very different level of um, how policing actually happens because one of the big controversies that we have going on now, let's just look at the Twin Cities, is that when there have been conflicts in Minneapolis, one of the critiques of the Minneapolis Police Department has been that many of the officers don't live in the city of Minneapolis proper. And so later on, I'll talk about what community policing means. And so, I mean, briefly, the history of this has everything to do with the fact that, you know, we're coming out of a segregated culture, we're coming out of a history of slavery, and we're coming out of, you know, the Jim Crow years. And what a lot of people don't um, realize about American politics is how long all of this lasted, right? And so what you're really talking about is more than 200 years of slavery, but then after that, 58 years of legal segregation. So within the context of that legal segregation, you aren't going to have any police officers of color. You're also going to have um, areas that are called sundown towns. And I know some of you all might be familiar with sundown towns. And once again, I want you to broaden your minds and think outside of the southern United States. Minnesota actually had sundown towns. And if you're wondering what a sundown town was, if you were um, not white once the sun set, uh, the police preferred that you not be on the streets. Um, and with that preference, um, if you were on the streets, they reserved the right to um, detain you. And so that, that is the backdrop for a lot of this conflict. Um, I teach young people, right? I teach um, undergraduates. Um, this might humble you a little bit. First year college students were born in 1999. <laughs> I still have clothes in my closet from 1999. None of them fit, but that's none of your business. I'm working it out. Um, you know, and so it's like, you know, often young, young people are thinking, you know, well, th this is our struggle. Right, like this is this is our journey. Um, you know, we often think when we're young, you know, nothing like this has ever happened before. Um, my response to students is that nothing but this has ever happened. This has always happened, right? This isn't, you know, that you know your generation. Um, just did this. Your generation is witnessing this and experiencing this, but if you live long enough, you might see several iterations of this, as unfortunate as that might be. So. Um, our modern notions of policing go back to something that were called the slave patrols. And so slave catchers were what people envisioned policing to be. And so particularly if you are in the South, um, the notion of um, policing has always been contested because it wasn't the idea of protecting communities. Like I remember growing up and watching Sesame Street and they had that whole thing, these are the people in your neighborhood and then like Mr. Policeman was supposed to come and help you, um, which like really works, right? If you live in that kind of neighborhood. Um, I know if someone broke into my house, I'd want someone to come help me. Um, but if you're not from that context, then your notion is that you will be policed. And being policed is different than feeling protected. And it comes out of the context of um, slave patrols were supposed to find um, people who were enslaved, who were trying to escape, or they were just supposed to um, you know, manage them in whatever way that that might mean. So um, police have you know, um, often had a situation where they have been brought in to decide um, what was good civil rights legislation and how to respond to it. And one of the things that comes to mind with this is that um, I will just bring up the Little Rock Nine. And so one of the things I love about having um, a crowd like this is that you all know what the Little Rock Nine is, right? So if you're teaching people that were born in like, you know, 97, uh, it was 40 years before they were 
were born and you have to like really walk them through it. And so as we know, um, Little Rock, Arkansas has a difficult time desegregating in 1957. And Central Rock High School is an experimental place where they're going to have nine African American children try to attend that high school. What you end up having is what we're having right now, which is a big fight between the federal government and certain states, right? And so at the time, Eisenhower is president, and the governor of Arkansas is Orville Faubus. And so Southern governors, um, you know, who really um, weren't in favor of being told what to do by Capitol Hill were very resistant. And so what's um, great about this time period is that um, there's only a little bit of television footage, because as many of you all know, like TV isn't even 10 years old at this point, but you have lots of um, taped conversations from the Oval Ho Office. And so you have basically like this smackdown between um, Favis and Eisenhower talking about, you know, I'm the governor, I'm the president, I'm the governor, I'm the president, right? Trying to figure out who's the man. And so um, Eisenhower clearly wants to be the man and decides to send in armored trucks and federal troops. And this is how we're going to manage children going to a high school. Um, what people do not know is that um, there's actually um, no ammunition in any of these rifles, you find out years later, um, even though you're talking about people who are 15, 16, 17 years old being escorted all throughout, let's just say the 10th grade for an entire academic year with people with rifles. Right now, I think to myself, 10th grade was a struggle for me for all kinds of reasons. And, you know, I wasn't being escorted by someone who had a rifle, who then years later, when I'm an adult, I'd find out who didn't even have ammunition in it, which is um, pretty upsetting given how resistant. Um, the crowds were to that high school being desegregated. So what you have here is just on this slide, one of the things I'm indicating is that you get um, tremendous gains from the federal government in the 1960s. These were some of the great wins of the civil rights movement. So you're gonna get the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, I don't even have on the slide, the Housing Act. Um, and then, you know, of course, um, you know, just, you know, more legislation, more legislation, but then, of course, you're going to get resistance, right? And so a lot of people now talk about Selma because Ava DuVernay did a film about Selma. And then, of course, you know, John Common, I mean, John Legend and Common did a great song um, about Selma. And so young people are like, oh, yeah, Selma, like that was this march. It was cool. And so I'll say to them, why were they marching? I don't know, but it was really cool. Um, <laughs> That's concerning, right? That's really concerning. And I agree, I like the song too, the song's amazing. However, what they were marching about is that you have this Voting Rights Act that then people in Alabama once again are saying, you know, we are not going to participate in this. And so then what you have is John Lewis, who now of course is you know, an elder statesman in Congress, but at the time is 22 years old, they're gonna walk across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And walking across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, then the local police are going to say that this is an act of resistance that's inappropriate, right? And what's really fascinating about this is that Congressman Lewis um, did an interview recently and said if that march hadn't happened, it wouldn't have opened us up for the civil rights gains that we had, even though the local police were trying to say that it was unlawful. And one of the strategies that was often used was, um, you cannot be doing this because you do not have a permit for a parade. And more than this number of people, clearly you're a parade, and so we'll detain you. Um, all of it, of course, they were actually trying to be in compliance in what was the law. And so I, I say all this to say that, you know, there really is um, this contentious relationship based on some material realities that have happened in many of our lifetimes. Um, for instance, um, Community policing, people often don't think of the Panthers as community policing, but it depends on you know what your lens is, right? So if you're a typical American, you're like, these were like terrifying black people with like big hair and guns, right? Now the hair was what people were doing at the time and it's making a comeback. But you know, the reason why they had the guns was because they said that they wanted to police themselves, which is fascinating because you know the NRA is really 
really kind of like edgy about taking on race issues. Like they totally believe in having guns. They totally believe in community policing. And then all of a sudden you give the guns to black men and they're like, we have no comment, <laughs> right? And it's like, but like, wait a minute, like what about a pol you know, community policing? And so the Panthers, a lot of people don't know, are coming out of the University of California system. They were actually very educated. Huey Newton had studied the law and Huey Newton was like, I know what the law is. I know what my rights are for having these guns. And we figured out the whole parade and permit thing. And we know how far away that we have to stand from people. And we're trying to do this. And of course, um, the governor of California, who um, you know at the time said, this is unacceptable. And so those, those are all the tensions that you have around who gets to police whom. And so after you get tremendous civil rights gains in the 1960s, and this piece you have heard from my Black Lives Matter talk, I often argue that then you're gonna get pushback in the 70s and 80s. And you know, I would stand by my um, assertion that I made a couple of years ago when Obama was still president, that when there comes a rise, there could be a fall. Um, I didn't want it to happen, right? So I don't like being right. Um, all I do is like study what, you know, what goes on and it makes you realize what could go on. And so after that, you get um, lawmakers kind of reconfiguring um, gains that people were trying to make with housing. This is when you get a lot of white flight, where you have like you know lower income, um, freestanding white homes, where people are trying, to, black people are trying to move into those neighborhoods, and then white people are thinking we have to go like a step up better so we can get away from them. And then you know you start getting like urban decay as well. All of this is going to be a formula for um, how do we make sure there isn't crime in these areas and how are we going to determine what crime is and how are we going to punish that crime. And the reason why I say determine what that crime is is because you know we have a, a local lawmaker, um, the great Judge Pam Alexander, that spent most of her career fighting about the discrepancy between um, crack and powder cocaine. Right, and so deciding that crack should get 30 years, you know, and powder cocaine, depending on how good your attorney is, could get you some public service, right? Um, and so all of those determinations, you know, lead to this thing that my students really don't understand because it predates them, which is the war on drugs, right? Um, and who is, um, you know, laying down you know, the first grenade for the war, who are we fighting and how are we fighting them? And are people going to start fighting each other as well? And so um, you know, all of this really ends up once again when you have um, police that don't live in neighborhoods, who are coming into neighborhoods, um, who want to um, make sure that certain members of neighborhoods are disciplined, that this anxiety heightens. And so um, this, I would argue, um, has had a tremendous devastating impact on black families. Like any sociologist would tell you that um, black men were in families um, up until the mid-1960s. Right? And so if you were to like, meet black people of a certain age, like my age and older, they would tell you that their father was in the home. Um, once you start meeting some black folks who are like 35 or younger, um, it's a little more dicey. It's a toss up. And one of the reasons why it's a toss up is because you get public policy that says that um, if the man is in the home, then you can't be a recipient of AFDC. And so then a lot of people don't know that the men were leaving to actually support their families. And then, of course, you get within this war on drugs and three strikes are out and all of this, this movement to prisons that ends up being en masse, right? Which, if you're old enough, this did not exist. Like this did not exist in the 60s and the 70s. Um, and I would say there was, there was just particularly no such thing when you talk about women, right? Now Shakopee Women's Prison is at full capacity 2,000, right? In the state of Minnesota, if you were go, to go back to the early 1970s, I am told that all the women in the entire state, I mean, this is like Fergus Falls to like, you know, Hibbing, Rochester, everywhere, fit in like a three-story Victorian. 
right? And they were being detained for whatever reason possible. Um, now, and I know this um, because when I was in law school, um, I did my internship at Shakopee, right? The women are there, and they are there very much so because they're linked to men who've been involved in these crimes. And now that the laws have changed, um, even being in the car with someone who's doing something like this um, can get you sent away. What does that mean for the children? I had clients who both parents were detained, right? So I had um, this one woman whose um, husband has been sent to the federal penitentiary in the state of Virginia, and the daughter was in high school in the Twin Cities. And so this, this is what this leads to. And so all of this, of course, um, can you know, end up creating a notion of anger and distrust. And so that's really to contextualize for you. Um, you can often meet people of color and they'll say to you, you know, I don't trust the police. I don't trust the police. And so one way to respond to that, of course, would be this idea of trying to become the police. Um, which, as I said, you know, then becomes this very important effort given the fact that um, it hasn't been easy for communities of color to either make that decision or to enter police forces. And they're doing that, right, because then the notion is maybe we can serve and protect ourselves, right, which is a very different way than they might have even grown up, a different way of thinking about it. And so once you end up on a police force, um, one of the questions that I really wanted to look at when I was writing this book was, um, what's the training, right? So, you know, how do you become a police officer? Is it standardized against, the, you know, across the entire nation? Is it particular to um, certain spaces? Like, how does this operate? And so, um, you know, you have to learn how to use a firearm, clearly. So there's 60 hours of training um, for that. I have no idea if that's sufficient, okay? That's not my area of expertise. Um, so if you want to bring that up during questions, I can tell you now, I don't know. However, um, what I can speak to is that um, some police um, forces require some kind of diversity or sensitivity training. Some do not. Okay, which depending on where you live, um, I would argue that could be extremely problematic because you might not understand the community that you're policing. If you think about St. Paul, if you think about the different languages that are spoken, if you think about different immigrant communities, um, you know, this, this can end up being complicated if you don't know your population. Um, my research shows that the most training you would get from this, if you got any, would be eight hours and then you were sent off to police the Hmong or the Somali or the Eritrean or whomever. Okay, so um, police can feel very defensive, and I can understand that because the police feel like they are policed, right? It's a very stressful job. They feel as if um, people don't understand them, um, that they're accused of being racist, and that um, particularly in the last five years, they're under a tremendous amount of scrutiny. Um, so that is one way of looking at this. Um, the other way of looking at this is that the legal system protects the police. So um, their level of scrutiny is different from a private citizen, and this is one of the reasons, if we go back to the beginning of my talk with Eric Garner, um, why Officer Pantaleo um, ends up not being convicted, which might have been different if he had been a citizen of New York as opposed to a police officer. So um, police officers um, are rarely indicted. Um, and so, you know, that, that is something that also exacerbates the anxiety with some of um, these incidents. Something that um, I'll talk about now, just because um, I lived in Philadelphia um, shortly after this happened, is that um, there was a group of um, African Americans that were living in a home, um, the group called themselves MOVE. Um, they referred to themselves as a radical black liberation group. Um, others basically were referring to them as a cult. Um, to make a long story short, there was um, a lot of conflict between them and the police, and this ended up making national news because um, you know it ended up being an example of 
what would be considered extreme force. The reason why it was extreme force is because um, they ended up bombing the building that the people were in. 11 people were killed, including five children, and um, none of the officers were charged. And so this is in a neighborhood um, in Philadelphia, if you don't know much about Philadelphia, North Philly and West Philly um, are almost completely black. Um, and so um, when this happened there also at the time, this was um, 85, um, most of the police um, were white. This, this made for like the kind of intensity that we felt um, a few years ago um, when Philando Castile um, happened. I would actually argue um, more intensity because Philadelphia is the fifth largest the city in the nation um, and 85 was um, a particularly intense um, moment um, you know the Reagan Bush years so um, so as you know officers feel like they are policed um, black men in particular feel like you know they are under scrutiny just by walking down the street um, this leads to you know the whole idea of you know what is stop and frisk Right. And so I remember studying this in law school and just thinking, you know, this is fascinating that um, police are allowed to stop and frisk you if you look suspicious, um, because law is kind of like a secondary, um, you know, um, interest of mine. It wouldn't be like the primary way that I think um, the primary th way that I think would ask the question, why do people look suspicious? Right. So that's so. So if you look suspicious, I can stop and frisk you. Well, you know, I'm an academic. So, you know, if I were sitting in some grad seminar, I'd say, what does suspicious look like? Now, you can do that in the ivory tower and people are like, oh, that's engaging. That's it. You know, you can't really do that in the real world. Like no one cares. Right. They're just like, look suspicious. I'm good. I'm fine. Um, but this is this is why some people think that this is problematic, because um, if you fit a certain demographic, right, and it's a demographic graphic, um, if my father was still alive, that like he fit, that my brother fit, that my husband fit, that my 19 year old son fits, right? So it's like, if you look like that, maybe that's suspicious. Um, and so what happens if you just happen to be in what someone might consider a suspicious body? Right, because it's just it's just the body you have, um, and so that that's that part of the argument, right? But I want to give all the arguments. I want to give all the arguments because um, police officers are like, "Whoa, wait a minute!" Then all these people came out in 2013 and started talking about Black Lives Matter. Well, why don't Blue Lives Matter? Why doesn't my life matter? Think about the choices I've made. Think about the oath that I've made. I'm protecting people and my life is in danger all the time. And so that's their argument. They're like, sure, you know, there are police officers that aren't so great, but our entire profession's indicted for a few bad apples. Um, and so there you have that. Then there's also um, the notion of black on black crime. That's the other big critique that people say, um, why aren't people in the black community concerned about black on black crime? Um, you know, I actually take issue with that. I think that people just don't hear those arguments and I think that's because we worship in segregated spaces, right? To this day we do, um, unless like I know there's like some Unitarian churches where like everybody's there doing everything. That's cool, right? But love that, love that. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I think it still stands. Like if you're a practicing Christian, 11 o'clock in the morning on Sunday is gonna be your most segregated hour. If you went to a black church, Church, you're not gonna get through the hour and it's gonna be more than an hour actually but you're not gonna get through the first 20 minutes without someone talking about black on black crime they're not gonna call it that because that's not what we call it right because we're not like oh you know I'm black you're black you know there's crime right that's something the media created Right? What they're going to talk about is how Mrs. Johnson's nephew got killed. Okay? Because that's going to be a real little boy that's part of a real family with real adults, with pain and with harm. And they're going to be concerned about that. And believe it or not, they are just as concerned about that as they are concerned by police brutality. Because if it's your nephew, you're not really caught up in who did it, but that it happened. 
okay? But people don't know that. But I would really say that I've never in my life met a black person, and I know some black people, okay? That are just like, you know, well, my relative got murdered, and like, you know, the person who did it was black, so you know, it's all good. How does that work, right? And you all are laughing, but you know that you know someone who has said to you, you know someone, you might be related to that someone, it might even be you. Like, Why aren't they mad about black on black crime? Maybe we are, maybe you don't know us, right? That's part of it, maybe we don't know each other. But see, this is, this is what the arguments are going back and forth. And the Blue Lives Matter argue, argument doesn't take into account the simultaneity of the fact that you can be blue and black, right? All at the same time, right? So the new mayor of St. Paul, Melvin Carter III, right? His father, Melvin Carter Jr., recently retired from being a police officer for more than 30 years. He was blue and black, right? So he believes in policing, right? Anybody who's been a victim of crime wish the police had been there, right? He also will tell you and has said publicly many, many times that people are policed differently. And that he's been policed when people didn't know that he was blue and only saw that he was black. And so all of these things can be going on at the same time. Which leads us, of course, to Black Lives Matter. So in a nutshell, um, in so many ways, Black Lives Matter feels like it just started. In other ways, it feels like um, it's been going on for a very long time. Um, this contemporary moment right now started in 2013 after Trayvon Martin was killed. And when Trayvon Martin was killed, a lot of people don't realize that originally George Zimmerman wasn't even arrested because he said he defended himself. And so the police officers said, well, that seems reasonable. Um, what's interesting about um, you know, protests now happening in cyberspace, that it was a circulation of a petition through the internet that called for his arrest that started that trial. Once he went on trial, he was not indicted. Um, his lawyer's argument was the state of Florida's stand your law ground, which we don't have here in Minnesota. Um, he showed a picture of Trayvon Martin, and he said to the jury, which was 12 women, um, 11 white, one Latina, um, he said, my client was scared, wouldn't you be too? Whatever you think, I have to say, it's brilliant. It's brilliant, if he'd been in law school, he would have gotten an A. Right, because that's 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 how you do it, right? Because you you play on to um, who your audience is, and so the people in the jury were like, "Yeah, like I'd be scared." Uh, and so then, of course, the attorney could say, "Well, what do you think, Mr. Zimmerman did? Mr. Zimmerman stood his ground." And if you are afraid, you're allowed to defend yourself. Now this whole thing about one having Skittles and the other have a gun, that doesn't matter, right? Somehow that didn't matter. Um, and so Zimmerman goes free. In the midst of Zimmerman going free, these three um, young women end up tweeting the day of the acquittal, um, there is no justice, hashtag Black Lives Matter. What ends up happening is that there are five million tweets just that day people using that hashtag. That's how it comes about. It starts off at first as an internet movement. What it ends up becoming actually with people on the ground is when um, Michael Brown is killed in Ferguson the following year in 2014. Then people actually go to the space of Ferguson and then it starts looking like what we might consider to be a movement. Um, you know, a lot of people, find Black Lives Matter to be extremely controversial. When I spoke about it here last year, I said, you know, um, for people who are old enough to remember the March on Washington and this movement, 61% of Americans were opposed to the March on Washington, thought that Martin Luther King was disruptive, and talk about sundown towns, um, Josie Johnson, who is in her early 80s, will tell anyone that they were told to leave before the sun went down. She was both at the March on Washington and she was at the 4th Precinct in Minneapolis when Jamar Clark was killed and she said that Black Lives Matter had a much more welcoming tone than the March on Washington did. 
This is why I love oral history and Gallup polls, right? Because all the polls indicate that. All you have to do is pull the old newspaper articles and people are like, who's this Martin Luther King causing all these problems, right? This is before he won the Nobel Peace Prize. So um, these women you know, take this on and they take this on at a moment where there seems to be tremendous disruption. So um, you know, I think of my books as my offspring a little bit. You're not supposed to play favorites, but every now and then I do, both in my real life and with my books. So this is an excerpt from the page of this book, which is my favorite page. Um, and it's because um, this was such a sad, difficult, challenging moment, but I think this is so powerful that this is less than two years ago. And you know, these four bloody days in July 2016, we remember these days, right? So if we just go through the days, um, on July 5th, Alton Sterling, Sterling is shot and killed by two police officers outside of a convenience store. Um, that was challenging, um, particularly if you're like me and your um, second zip code is the internet and you're on there a lot and you see things, and I know it's not good for my health, right? But to see all that play out, it was really disturbing. Um, I went to bed early that night, um, partly because that had been so disturbing. When I woke up on July 6th, I found out that Mr. Philando Castile had been killed. Um, only, I think, nine miles from where I live. Um, as you know, not far from here, um, which was, you know, exponentially disturbing. Then, as agitated as I was, it was unimaginable to me that the very next day, um, then an African American, Micah Johnson, um, takes to the streets in Dallas, Texas, and shoots and kills five police officers um, and injures another seven. Just to keep in mind like who police officers are, all the officers he injures are not even white. And he says it had nothing to do with Black Lives Matter. Um, and so this, this is just, you know, hot summers in urban spaces. Um, it's almost predictable. And then, of course, the Dallas police are trying to figure out how to capture um, Micah Johnson. Um, and similar to move that happened in Philadelphia, um, they just sent off a bomb and killed him. And so these were four very difficult days, um, which helps us understand, um, you know, how you get, you know, all the strife that we have right now. And so I just have this image of the book because I, I think it's it's so fascinating um, that you have this very brave woman um, who is just like standing standing you know, in front of um, these you know, deeply armed police. And she, she's unarmed, and it's you know, just in protest to what um, happens in cities throughout the nation. This happens to be Baton Rouge. Um, this, of course, leads us to this moment that we are having now. So we just had the Super Bowl. We don't care as much as we would have if the Vikings had been in the game, right? But, you know, I'm sure many of you watched the game. And so many people are offended by Colin Kaepernick. Um, so many people are offended by taking the knee. People, um, I've seen people say that um, I kneel in prayer, you know, um, I stand for the flag. Um, I understand that, right? I think that there are people who kneel in prayer. Um, I think Colin Kaepernick prays. Um, he should, right, given um, how many death threats he probably gets on a daily basis. Um, that's, I mean, that's just real, um, you know, but he is taking a knee in protest to what has happened um, with what he would call police brutality. Um, the argument about all of this has gotten blurred. There are people that don't even know why he's taking a knee, right? They just think that he's like some guy with a big afro. I told you it was coming back, right? Um, some big afro who made a lot of money, um, who should be grateful that he made all that money, and who is disrespectful and unpatriotic because he won't um, sing the national anthem and he won't stand for the flag. Okay, let's just pause. That doesn't even make any sense. Like when you think about that, like when you, th when you think about that, that line of reasoning that you're gonna pay me a lot of money and I'm gonna be angry for no reason and then not wanna sing the national anthem and salute the flag. 
and you were gonna pay me a lot of money. Something's missing in that narrative, right? What's missing in that narrative is this protest against police brutality. That's a pretty big piece of the story to be missing. Right? People just don't give up millions of dollars and say, I'm not going to acknowledge that song I was raised on or acknowledge this flag, which represents the nation that I'm a citizen of, unless something happened. Um, in our country, sometimes people don't ask, like, what happened? You know, I'm one of those people, I'm like, what made you look suspicious? I just like to ask, why is he kneeling? Right? It's okay if you disagree with him kneeling. I would just like people to even think through why he's even doing it, as opposed to just saying, it's just wrong. Well, why is it wrong? He's the one who doesn't have a job anymore and is getting death threats. Um, you know, so that, that's just something um, to think about. So the future of American policing, one of the things that um, we wanted to do in this book, and I say we, I have to um, acknowledge, I have a co-author, her name is um, Rebecca Rissman, and um, she's great with um, translating my thoughts into language for sixth to 12th graders. So this is actually written for sixth to 12th graders. Um, but when parents get a hold of my books, they often pull me aside and say, you know, it actually was good for me too. So um, I recommend the books for adults. When we were thinking this through, we were saying, okay, you don't just lay out all the problems. And sometimes that's all you can do, but um, where would we like to see this going? Um, one of the things that isn't talked about very much is what is the stress and anxiety for people who are police officers? Like that has to be acknowledged. That's very real. And that doesn't really matter what race you are, right? I mean, if you are, you know, holding a gun with the thoughts that someone might also have a gun, you know, what is the outcome of that? And so, one of the things we discussed was screening police officers' mental health, right? Um, much more than what happens. And the data around that was staggering in terms of um, not how you get on police force, right? Most people get there and like, you know, their mental health looks fine. That's fantastic. You know, I, after I've had a bad semester, I want someone to screen my mental health, right? I look very different like in December than I did in September. Right? I'll look very different in May than I do right now. I mean, after you've been through some things, like you're super agitated and no one has a gun. And so it's like, how do we keep up with people who have this really intense profession to make sure that they're okay? Um, also, one of the things that came out of Black Lives Matter um, that a lot of people who have made the argument, it's like, well, what did they stand for? What did they ask for? What came of it? It's just a bunch of nonsense. Actually, there was no such thing as um, body cams until this happened, and the use of body cams, and the push of body cams, which all happened on a local level, right? That's not like it's federal policy. These are things that you, know, you bring to your city council and your local police to make happen. So there's that. Um, and then some delayed, some data collected. So this whole notion of stop and frisk, um, we can really get a sense of um, who's being stopped, Right, um, and if you're in a place that is 90 some percent white, like if you're in Duluth and 85 percent of the people being stopped are black, like you just need to ask yourself, like who's being stopped, and why are they being stopped, um, and what are you finding? You know, if you're finding something every time, maybe it's working. Um, you know, some of the data suggests that things aren't being found, and then um, once again. Are we going to insist that communities police themselves? Are we going to um, insist, for instance, if you're the mayor of St. Paul, obviously you have to live in St. Paul. What happens um, that the mayor and the members of city council have to have buy-in in the local city, but the police do not, right? And some people say that that doesn't matter. Um, I think depending on the city, maybe it can, maybe it doesn't, right? So I mean, I live in Vadnais Heights. I don't see a lot of difference between us and Shoreview. There could be, I don't see a lot of difference, right? I think there is a big difference between North Minneapolis and um, I, don't, I don't know, like, why is that a, I think it's a big difference. I don't think those are, I don't think those places are similar, right? I don't think anybody who lives in YZ would let you think that they lived in North Minneapolis if they paid those property taxes. They'd be like, oh, I live in YZ, right? And so, I mean, I, I don't know if you're in those different places if you should police those places. Um, you know, and that, that's something that we can talk about. And so finally, you know, I will just um, 
you know, end on this note. Um, if nothing else, we should all have buy-in, right? Like this should take us back to Sesame Street, the whole notion, these are the people in your neighborhood, right? Like everybody should um, probably know something about their local police. Um, and feel good that they are there. I think that that is a part of how we understand citizenship in a democracy in a nation like this. Um, and I think that um, unfortunately, people don't feel the same in, in different places about their police. Um, and then I think the other thing that um, we're all challenged to do is just to admit what we don't know and acknowledge that and be able to talk about that, right? And so I think that um, it is a challenge sometimes for people to say, I've never thought about that before, or maybe I don't understand that, or um, what does it mean when you say that something is racialized? People often don't even know what that means, and so then they shut down, partly because they think someone's accusing them of being a racist, right? And that often is not what's going on. Um, what's going on is that um, someone like me would make the argument that um, certain situations are particular, right? And so um, Somali communities might do well with Somali police. And so with that, um, I've spoken nonstop for 45 minutes. I am gonna leave it there and then we can talk a little bit. And I would be glad to bring the microphone around to those who have questions so that everybody can hear the questions. And I see there's one right here. That was just brilliant. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking about the context that this police force grew up in, which is our communities. Mm -hmm. uh, commonly, law enforcement, I worked in the arena for a long time. And police would say, this is what the community wants us to do, mm -hmm. whether that was implementing um, occupation of the north side. Mm -hmm. uh, but the context. The racial context, um, I just like your comments about how this did not happen in a vacuum. This happened within the context of a country struggling with racial issues and race policies. And I'd just like to hear what you say about that. Sure. If that makes sense. I mean, it does. It does. I mean, I think part of it is we also have to acknowledge how spaces can change. Right, so I moved to the Twin Cities in 91, and that was before the Somali war broke out and before Somali came to Minnesota. It's also before the Hmong came, like in the numbers that they are here now. Um, so to say that St. Paul is the same, right, it, it isn't the same. And so one of the things I understand is that you have some generational tensions in terms of how we used to do certain things, right, like how we used to police, um, could have possibly worked, right? That's why this isn't an indictment, right? Like, I'm not someone that's going to go somewhere and say, oh, you're completely getting this wrong. It isn't that. It's just that sometimes the situation can change. I remember I didn't even know what the group Karen was. And then they got the first Karen police officer. And then they have a language. And then you have all this stuff going on that I am sure people have not been prepared for. What my issue is is that I have found that it has been easier for me um, in my own profession and dealing with people with just saying, this has changed, I'm not prepared for this, right? Like my students are like, do you want to Instagram me? Nope. <laughs> Thank you for asking. It has changed, I don't understand it, right? And so it's just, you know, I didn't say it was stupid or they were wrong. I said, you know, I'm old enough to be your mom and you're gonna have to meet me where I am, right? <laughs> and so that, that, that is, that's it. And so I don't think, you know, and, I, and I'm only working with like almost 27 years of knowledge here that St. Paul is the same city that it was. I live in southwest Minneapolis, and we had a police shooting there last year involving a blonde young woman from Australia. Could you explain what's going on legally with that case? I don't you know, understand not, that. I actually know a little bit about that. It wouldn't be because I'm a professor. Um, so I am on the governor's board of public defenders. And so what we do is, there's seven of us on the board. I'm a public, public member because I have a law degree, but I'm not a practicing attorney. And what we do is support the public defenders. And so what I have heard um, tangentially about that is that unfortunately it's just probably gone on too long 
right? And um, I, I can't say that I know why, but unfortunately, and for those who aren't familiar, so the Australian woman gets killed by the officer, once again, racialized policing, he's Somali, right? So now we have a black officer killing a white woman, which I promise you in my parents' lifetime in the South, that was inconceivable. So just even looking at that is like, it's a, things have changed, right? Things have changed. Um, so if my, if my dad were still alive, he'd be 83. If he'd wanted to be a police officer, they wouldn't have even let him have a gun. Okay. And so, um, how is that going to turn out? I will just say, um, given our track record and given how, um, intense this is, I am pretty sure half of the city's not going to be happy. Is that fair? I, I am pretty sure, I don't care how that turns out, half of Minneapolis is not going to be happy. And also, the longer it takes, and this might sound strange to you, but I mean, all the studies show we behave differently when it becomes hot. If they re resolve this, so to speak, in the summer, well, those four days that we had in 2016, we, we have a long pattern of that. Watts did not happen in winter. Okay. Why the grand jury? You know, that's an excellent question. Um, there are arguments now being made that there not be grand juries when police are being charged. The law now, with the discretion of the attorney general, is to be able to bring one in. That was the choice, right? Do I, you know, do you, Aviva, do you want to? I'm just po oops, sorry. I'm just positing that because calling a grand jury means you can compel testimony. A person does not have to speak to the police if they want don't want to. This person who who did the shooting, who was not the not the officer at the window as, of, of the car, as you know. Um, it obviously is refusing to testify. He could take the Fifth Amendment if he wants to, but that could also cause the, the grand jury to come to some conclusion, whether it's to indict him or just to say, there's nothing we can do, I don't know. But the purpose of calling the grand jury is that when you're in front of the grand jury, you have to answer the questions. So that's my, I've heard that suggested, and that to me sounds like the only way that at least there's an opportunity for the community, which is the grand jury, to ask questions. That's Thanks, Aviva. Well, and thank you for sure. being here. And you answered a lot of my questions sure. within all of that context. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the things that you kind of touched on, though, is the misconception that mm -hmm. only white officers exhibit bias. Mm -hmm. And can you speak a little bit to um, police culture for all people, sure. how bias is normalized within their systems. Sure, I mean, you know, part of it is you're in such a dangerous situation and you don't have a lot of time to act, right? And so you have literally seconds to make a decision. And also one of the things I didn't even talk about in this presentation that's relevant to some of this is how many officers have a military background which is a different setting, right? And so if you've been active in the military, the training for that really isn't to ask questions, right? It isn't to stop or frisk, it's just to shoot, right? And so let's say you've done that for a couple decades and then you become a police officer. Well, the bias might not even be a racial bias, the bias is just to eliminate. Now, if you're in certain communities, then they're gonna be communities of color, right? Um, so that's, that's how that plays out. I have a question. What about the psychological um, testing for uh, people, applicants to be police officers? Would that help and could they weed out some of them that have such a fast trigger finger? Well, see, that, you know, what I was saying earlier is that, you know, everyone has to have a certain level of screening. But I would say that who you are when you start a job and maybe even only five years into it, so it's like you have your initial screening, that could be the only screening. Right? I'm like screen a professor like, you know, three weeks before like their seven year earn sabbatical, see what their level of stress is. Right? I would fail that test. It would be like, she should leave campus. 
right? Because it's, it's like, you know, my level of anxiety by that time is just like, I don't want to talk to anyone until I get this break. Um, that to me is partly what the problem is. You don't, you know, screen some 19 year old that hasn't been on the job and say, are you stressed? It's like, no, I'm excited. I'm getting a job. Okay, that's fantastic. Why don't you screen people after they've been in a shooting? and have some mandatory PTSD um, stuff and some mental health training too along the way. I'd like to say, I think we can crystallize part of the problem here and say that what the police are doing is not working, you know, and it's partly that change that you're talking about, but it, I think it's always been that way. You mentioned when you talked about the slave patrol, there was always the night patrol and it was Officer O'Reilly who was acting like a bouncer rather than somebody who was enforcing the statutes of the community. He was, he was enforcing a community standard that he and his friends believed in. Yeah. But uh, what I wanted to say is that it's not working. Here in Roseville, we had a situation where a person who uh, had some mental problems, you know, psychological problems, was killed by the police in a tragic uh, situation where the police procedures completely failed. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's mm -hmm. partly, I, I recognize that racism is a very important component and it's a problem we need to attack, but also the police procedures, the way that they have invented being a policeman, mm -hmm. not what is statutorily uh, demanded, but what they have invented as being a policeman is not working. Yeah, and I mean, the only thing I would say in response to that is that I think that there might be some small towns where it's working, right? I mean, like really small communities where people know people and understand people. And I mean, that, that's the other thing that I think needs to be taken into account. Like, I don't think policing in Stillwater plays out the way policing in Minneapolis plays out, right? I think that there are communities... Um, you know, I have relatives in like smaller towns in the south, kind of rural areas. Trust the police, get along with the police, um, kind of low crime areas, you know, not that stressful. People who've lived there hundreds of years, families know each other, there aren't outsiders, all this stuff. We have like immigration patterns and 500,000 people. That's a different thing. Yeah, that, that, that too. Yeah, that's, yeah that's definitely, that definitely could not be safe. And, that, and that's real. And that could happen anywhere. Except, of course, a town that might say, you know, like, you know, I, I have a, a son that struggles with some issues. Like, in our neighborhood, people will just be like, oh, well, that's Austin. Right? And so that's the city of 500,000 people? No. That doesn't work. Uh, professor, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very insightful. Um, I've got a quick question that I'd like to ask a follow-up. I don't want to mischaracterize the tenor of your analysis, but would you say it would be fair to say that not the only root cause, but a principal root cause, is either racism uh, in society or racialism in policing? Um, I would just say that we all have bias, right? So what's different with policing is just that they have guns and they're allowed to use them, okay. right? <laughs> so the, it's just we all have bias. The follow-up to that is I think that there are a number of uh, really material points that need to be considered by everyone that have nothing to do with either racism or racialism. First of all, if there were to be a statistical and numerical analysis of the results of excessive use of force in Ramsey County in Minneapolis over 30 years, you would find that the body count is quite diverse. And you would find that the Ramsey County attorney and the Hennepin County attorney have an amazing track record of turning their back on incredibly troubling incidents. Uh, here is another factor that contributes to this. And one specific one that I would cite is the gentleman in about 2012 who was, excuse me if I'm not using the proper word, he was a leader in the deaf mute community. He was not able to speak. Right. He was on the way to Regions Hospital to visit his wife who was in the emergency room. He was dragged not out the door, he was dragged out the window 
beaten, handcuffed, taken to the Ramsey County Jail, where he was not let out of his cell for like four days, which is a violation of the law. Um, that resulted in like an $800,000 settlement in a year when St. Paul settled like $10 million. Quick question. Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory was required for all post-certification until the 1980s. MMPI has the capability to remove the 4% to 6% that are sociopaths. What role do you think? Do you think that the MMPI should be reinstituted, required, and not have a union-picked psychologist evaluate the police? Wow, I mean, that's an excellent question. Um, first of all, I, I do not feel qualified to um, you know, speak to if that test should be reinstated. Um, it's clear to me that the police would, you know, want their union pick psychologist. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure um, who should say the psychologist should be or what the testing should be. Like, I think that's a little out of my realm. Um, but I think that the fact that the incident that you described happened, and I know things like that unfortunately happen quite frequently, um, speaks to the fact that it's necessary. Professor Harris, thank you for all you do. Um, question, and I know you're not going to have a lot of data because this is, again, kind of uh, new, but what effect does uh, women in the police force have? What are the specific issues, and are they policing better than the men? I mean, what, what little data that you have, or if you have any data regarding that, and can we expect more women? I think the data comes from looking at the military, because you know that that's that's the place where you know women entered in larger numbers first, and so I think that um, you know one of the stresses within the military was you know conflict with officers within the military. So I think it will be a while um, before we get good data about this. Partly because we're also in the moment of Me Too, right? And people still don't know what they should speak about. Um, but I think having women um, in the police makes this even more complicated. Thank you, Professor. Um, I have a uh, couple of questions. One is a follow-up question. Is that, can you hear me now? Okay. One is follow-up question on, on the screening that you, we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Do you think it will be helpful that every couple of years, officers get a repeat screening to see where they are in terms of mental health? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. All right. And the second question is about insurance. Uh, in, once in a while, you hear that officers should have their own liability insurance like doctors oh, yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I honestly haven't given that much thought. Um, but I mean, I know if I were part of a police officer family, it would make sense to me. Um, but I mean, I, I can't say that I've given that a lot of thought. Because I don't know if officers get sued personally or if departments get sued. So that's part of it. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, do you know about City Heat Motorcycle Club? And if you do, do you know, do you have an opinion? No, I don't. I'm sorry. I don't. And there's a question way over here. If I could just pass the microphone. Thank you. Yeah, pr Professor, you talked about community policing. It just reminded me of quite a number of years ago, there was an effort made in both cities, St. Paul and Minneapolis to encourage officers to live in their communities. They were given low income loans, mm -hmm. reduced housing prices and all that kind of stuff. It was good intentions, but I think the police union and even the officers pushed back and it, it all kind of went away. But if it hadn't, how much do you think that would help? I mean, I think it makes a big difference because once again, it goes back to trust, right? So I think if you look at smaller communities where police officers are recognizable, they're trust, they trusted, they they speak to people, um, they understand and recognize people. Um, so a police officer might say, you know, oh, that's Austin, and you know, this kid isn't cutting up. Um, I think that it would make a tremendous difference. But you know, we live in a society where people don't ever want their rights curbed in any kind of way. And and so people want to be able to say, you know, I have the right to live wherever I want. 
um, and not think about the fact that like the mayor doesn't. You know, and there are many public officials that don't. I used to be a civil rights commissioner for the city of Minneapolis, and I had to give it up because I moved. So, um, which, you know, to me, I had less of a charge to the city than a police officer does. Uh, okay, I see a question over here, and then I think there was a repeat question, but I'm taking the mic over here. I'd like to ask if you think there is evidence or if you've seen evidence uh, that many police want to be anonymous. I'm not sure what you, what you mean by that, like not known in communities? Yes, that you know, they would I, prefer perhaps. I have uh, no idea. To, uh, you know, you do hear about police covering their badges, for example. Sure. Um, you know, I have no idea. I mean, I just know how being known, you know, could work for you. Right? You just go in, you get your cup of coffee, people recognize you, enjoy being around you. So, I mean, I can see that. So, I, I mean, I don't know. Does anybody else have a question in this side? There. Okay, I'm going to give it to this gentleman as a follow up. There's an intersection of City Heat Motorcycle Club with white supremacy oh, ideas. Okay, okay. Off-duty Minneapolis sure. and Chicago police officers, and well, it's a personal thing, loud noise, but um, anyway, that's what that is. It's, okay. it's something I'm surprised that it's, it's not uh, known as widely as, uh, as I thought it would be. I mean, I'm not familiar with the name, but it goes back to um, this question about women being in the police, right? Which is like, you know, what do you do when there's conflict within the police, right? So what do you do if there are white supremacist police officers and then Latino police officers? Um, what do you do when you have, you know, male police officers that, you know, might be physically aggressive with women? Um, that, that's part of what happens once again with this change, right? Now that policing is becoming this different thing, like St. Paul has a police officer who wears the hijab, right? So now that policing is becoming this different thing, then people are going to have to behave differently. Um, part of it is that we struggle with behaving differently. We all know that, right? People like to do what they like to do, um, which isn't always helpful. Hi. Hi. So um, I'm wondering if you could comment on the accountability for police officers, specifically the, brand, the grand jury and its effectiveness in holding police officers accountable, because that's where they get indicted. Right. I mean, I think that, once again, there's two sides of this. Police officers say that it is unfair, that, um, that they're going to trial for using the best judgment that they have. Um, people who are victims of this think that they get too much protection. And so it's, it's one of those things where only those who are in the position to decide, right? This is where someone like the Attorney General comes in, that these, de these decisions are made. Because if you're going to talk to anyone in the police family, they'll say, you know, look what we're going through, and I made the best decision I could make under the circumstances. You know, they would say, you know, I thought it was a gun. Just, the reason why I was asking this is that I served on a grand jury, and we had four cases of police-involved shootings during the time that I served on that in Hennepin County. There were no indictments. There usually aren't. For people in the room that right. don't realize this, there are hardly ever an right. indictment. And in fact, for 22 years, there has not been an indictment. That does not surprise Hennepin. me at all. So that's what my concern is about mm -hmm. grand juries and the system that's set up right. for holding people accountable is that it looks good, it sounds good, it doesn't work. But I think that what the government had initially decided was that if you have taken this oath to serve and protect, you will get the benefit of the doubt. I think, however, it was at a moment that was less complicated. That, to me, is one of my problems with the law. I know you're not supposed to critique the law if you went to law school, but I critique the law all the time, right? And one of my problems with the law is that I think the law should be a little more fluid. Should be a little more fluid. Like, if we're talking about the NRA, the truth of the matter is the Second Amendment happened when we had bayonets. Well, you know, now people have machine guns. So it's a different thing. And if people don't want to keep up with the times, then you have 22 years of no indictments. A speculative question. 
um, take away the political realities, the existent realities. I am appointing you for four years to be the, to be the chief of police of the city of Minneapolis. Do I have to take this job? Yes. <laughs> but you can do anything you want regardless of where the union and everyone else comes down, what are you going to do as the chief of police for the next four years? Follow that. I am appointing you the mayor of Minneapolis. Oh, no, no, no. Or following no, you. No, no. What I are you going to do I there? don't even want to do that for play. Okay, so I'm not even going to be the, play, the mayor for play. Um, in an imaginary world, I'm the chief of police of Minneapolis. Honestly, the first thing I would do is say that if you do not live in Minneapolis, you cannot be in the police. That would really be the first thing I did. I would start there, and then I would also, as a part of the screening, ask people what policing means to them, which I know sounds really academic and geeky, but I just want to know why people are in the room. I think it is a fair question to ask someone why they are choosing their job. And if the answer is, I want to bust some heads and then go live like a half an hour away, you probably shouldn't have that job, and that's when you've passed the screening. That's the answer, right? In the beginning of the job. Follow up with those people five years later and see what it looks like. I don't want to be the mayor. <laughs> what do you think, uh, in terms of body cams, uh, is that going to incent police officers to behave differently? This is the only way in which I am cynical. I try not to be cynical, because this is like a tough job. But like seriously, you know, they, they turn those cameras off? I mean, they, they turn, I cannot remember what the most recent, um, I, don't, I don't know if it was like what was going on in Charlottesville, but I mean, it was one of the most recent explosive things. And the first thing I looked for, I was like, oh, I can't wait to see what happened with the body cameras. Next thing I know, they're like, oh, they fell off. Really? <laughs> they fell off? Like, did your, did your like, vest fall off? Nothing else fell off but the camera. Okay. So, I mean, I'm glad we have them, but when people are resistant, people will do resistant things. I want to do a follow-up on that because it's sort of a question I was thinking about. Have you seen this documentary called The Force about the Oakland Police Force? I have not. Well, I have it's, not. it's great, but I, when I started watching it, they draw heavily on body camera mm -hmm. evidence, and it turns out nobody believes it. It's not conclusive. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. Does, and do I mean, body and that's cameras the, that, I mean, that's the other thing that I think that, um, you know, it's like the phrase, evidence of things not seen. Right? And then there's evidence of things that are seen that we don't believe. All of that's going on. So, you know, we're all old enough to remember Rodney King. So that's the first time we had evidence and we had some things that we could see. And what did they do? They moved the jury from Los Angeles proper, sent it to Simi Valley, which was a police town, right? And then you had the trial in Simi Valley, and people were like, oh, that camcorder thing, that's interesting. But, you know, maybe he should have been beaten by all those batons. And then, you know, they all go free. So it's, it's, it's complicated because then, you know, you start asking also, you know, you're in the grand jury, all this. It's like, you know, what's jury selection? All of it is so complicated. Who are prosecutors? You know, do we have elected judges, appointed judges? It's, it, it's nuanced and people don't want all that. People just want to feel safe and they don't want to ask difficult questions because that makes us feel uncomfortable. Just a quick one on, on indictments and people being found guilty and maybe laws that aren't so, uh, that are biased. You know, like the stop and frisk one yeah. and then the war on drugs. I mean, there was an incredible percentage of black men that were right. put in jail then in prisons. I don't know, I'd, I'd like to know, have they been let out since the, the laws have changed? They haven't been. No. There's, there's more still. Mm. I mean, something like that. And the women in that Shakopee prison, yeah. isn't it like 700% or 7,000% more than 800% more since, 800 since the 70s. More. And um, no, they have not been set free. Um, and part of that is that um, depending on what circle you're in, it might not be common knowledge that prisons are often for profit. And not just for the prison, but for the town. 
And so you build a prison, you create jobs, right? And then also the prison needs products that corporations sell to them. And so it's like who benefits by prisons? Um, actually everyone except for the people who are detained and the people who love them. And have you seen Michael Moore's documentary, Where to Invade Next? That one I haven't seen, but the, the great one to see is um, Ava DuVernay's 13th, where she talks about, um, you know, how the corporations benefit. And depending on what your retirement plan is, it's like, I'm scared to look at my 403B to think how I'm implicated in this. There's probably some stock I have that that corporation is benefiting from some prison somewhere. Um, every, everybody's in this, like, somehow. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's not yet available in DVD. As soon as it's available in DVD, we will have it. Yeah, Professor, uh, it's appropriate. How we're just coming off the Super Bowl, and you had a picture of Colin Kaepernick yeah. up there. There's no question that he's being blackballed by the league. Mm -hmm. he's, he should be in. He's got the talent. It's the corrupt NFL that's shafting him. But I have a scenario that I wanted to throw out and see what you think. I think where he got into trouble was the disrespect for the flag because the flag is wrapped around patriotism and the military. Yeah. So I was thinking that I'm fully in support of what he did. But let, let me throw this out. If he would have stood for the national anthem and then took the knee and held up the game with hopefully some fellow players. Right. I think that would have got his message out, and yet he wouldn't have disrespected the flag. What do you think? Well, you know, um, I understand that Judge Alan Page spoke about this recently, partly because he knows so much about the NFL and the law, right? So who else to speak on this? And one of the things that I understand that Judge Page said was that you can't get this right. Right? You can't get, I mean, it's just like, so it's, it's protest. So no one likes it, right? And I mean, it's like, no one's supposed to, feel, that's not even the point. And so when you think about um, Muhammad Ali, um, a lot of people don't remember, he's born Cassius Clay. Then he takes on Islam, he becomes Muhammad Ali, he's like the best prize fighter in the world, you know, and his ego would tell you that even if you didn't ask. And then the next thing you know, he doesn't want to fight in, fight in Vietnam? Whoa, now people would just say, you know, he got it wrong. He for certain got it wrong for that particular moment. How is he remembered now? Right? Everybody's just like, oh, Muhammad Ali was wonderful. He was despised when he did that. And I mean, and not only did he do it, he did it in the only way he did things, which was in a huge way. And what does he say? No Vietnamese ever called me the N-word. Whoa, this is what he says to Walter Cronkite? What? People are like, that's not American. He really wasn't preoccupied with that. Right? And so I think Colin Kaepernick is like, if you're gonna protest, you're just gonna protest. You can stand, you can kneel, you can salute, you can sing the national anthem, you can look at the flag, you can hold the flag, but if I am taking a stand against police brutality in the midst of what is the most capitalist space of Americana, and no one knows, knows that better than us from two days ago, right? Right? No one knows that better than we do. It was like 70,000 people in U.S. Stadium Bank, right? So, I mean, you know, whatever you do to move against that is going to be wrong. I think we should end. Should we, should we end? Okay. okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. Just a second. No, no, just a second. Um, I think Aviva has an announcement for the Ali registered people, and I'll turn the mic over in a minute. For everybody else, please come back next week. Two more sessions, uh, more beyond that, uh, and come early, because as you know, it's very popular.